All right, so I'll be just really quick. I think announcements are clear, right? So let me know if you have any question. Okay, so hopefully um, that makes sense for everyone. Um, no question. Okay, so let's get into lecture. So the lecture um, will be, we'll be co covering uh, five things today. So it's actually a very dense class. Let's try to do this pretty fast. All right, so first of all, so we talked about the, um, well, um, real number inputs, right? Last time, like for instance, predicting um, height given weight. Oh, nice color. Okay, so, um, but then, The thing is that we're not always seeing the um, real number input. So we might also see some categorical inputs like uh, gender, for instance, when we're trying to predict the height, because apparently um, the height will be also dependent on the gender. Um, so now let's consider a problem of predicting height given not just weight, uh, but also gender. Then the question is, how can we handle such categorical inputs. So we call these categorical inputs because um, it's basically categories, right? Instead of real numbers. So I'll just give you the answer. Um, the answer is that, although maybe you might be able to find a better one, but then in general, in uh, deep learning, what we use is we create a one hot vector for each category. So in this case, we have two categories, right? Male and female. So what we can do is then we first create a vector of size of the number of categories. So in this case, two, right? And then uh, we just assign one to the, uh, the dimension that corresponds to the category. So in this case, for instance, female will be one zero because um, in this case, I assign the first dimension to the female. And then I can also assign the second dimension to male. Then in that case, then the male will be zero one. So now you clearly see that we had this, um, categorical input, but now we have uh, some vector input instead. So this, we, this is something we can use instead. So you might also ask why, why don't we use instead, for instance, um, just map male to maybe zero and female to one, not just a, not a, not a, a two dimensional vector, but I mean, another option could be for instance, um, so why not um, female to, uh, one and male to just zero. Um, so actually for binary input, this works, but then what if it's, uh, um, there are th three categories, then in that case, for instance, um, let's say that we have another um, gender, for instance, um, let's say we have a other, other gender, and then this other gender will be then assigned to two, but then this is actually problematic because Actually, this is more of a mathematical property that when you're trying to put, uh, trying to use input uh, uh, from two, it's well. So I, I think it's uh, first of all empirically it doesn't work well. So I think that's one thing. So why then? Why why do we? Uh, why don't they work well? Uh, it, there are several reasons. One is that if we do this way, then the model needs to be able to uh, think of female as something between the um, other gender and the male gender, right? But then um, it's not always the case. It's basically, you're assuming that there is some uh, linearity between these three genders, but it's not always the case. We're more of uh, assuming that they're all independent. So it's, it's, it's better to actually um, usually enumerate the, the vector of size of the number of categories instead of uh, assigning a uh, number to each category. It's more of an empirical thing, but there are also some mathematical properties if we get into that more deeply. Okay, um, so, so, and then uh, we can then concatenate the genders vector representation with the, the weight. So in that case, then how, what's the size of the input now? It's size of input will be three, right? So weight is, uh, is taking up one dimension and the gender is taking up in this case, two dimensions. Of course, if we have more genders, um, apparently we have more genders, then we can do like four to five genders, then uh, apparently uh, we'll then have a, a four plus one input dimensions or five plus one input dimensions. So then it's good, right? Because now we're again, we were um, using the categorical inputs, but we're again using um, every input now is again, all real, real numbers. 
All right, so that's hopefully clear. So then how about the outputs? So we're talking about the categorical inputs, but uh, we're always uh, assuming real number outputs, but then what if the output is also, we want it to be categorical? And as you probably know um, from other classes too, it's called classification. Yep. So, and in fact, the the way we approach this is very similar. It's uh, we um, we want uh, non-numeric outputs. Then okay, we can we can also try to predict one hot vector as the output. And this problem is called um, classification. And so let's suppose that now instead of trying to predict the height, let's let's see we want to predict the um, the whether a person is an adult or a teenager given the weight and gender. Then um, we can do the same thing. We can say adult is uh, one zero, right? One zero, and teenager is zero one. Then. The, now the difference is then now, instead of having one real value output vector, we now have a two real value output. And what we can do on top of that is then we're trying to basically match or uh, match the, the prediction. Here, the prediction is vector two, right? And then also we have the label, which is also a vector. So we're trying to make them as close as possible to each other. So um, there are several ways to do this. Of course, we can still use the um, mean, uh, mean square error loss. I think I realized that I didn't talk about this in a, a previous lecture, but it's a pretty simple thing. Basically, it's L2 distance. It should be, um, I think everyone who took um, deep learning or machine learning should know this. Um, but then in practice, this doesn't work well. So that's the important thing. And I think this is also should be a review for most people. But then the point is that instead of using the maximum likelihood, no, not maximum likelihood, the mean square error, for the categorical outputs empirically, what we see is that it's much better to formulate this into a probability distribution and then trying to maximize the labels probability. So that's what, what we, people call maximum likelihood estimation. So hopefully this is also familiar to most people here. Um, I think it's more of a prerequisite, but let's uh, do a review. So what, that, what, what does that mean? Well, that means then instead of, um, um, well, we're considering the model's output as the probability distribution. So it's still similar to the, how we would do for the MSC, but let's say that um, for instance, the model, um, output something like that we're still considering this problem adult teenager thing and then suppose that uh, the output of the model so this is zero point three comma zero point seven so then we're interpreting this vector as the models what model thinks of the um, the this axis well whether it it's teenager or adult um, as a probability distribution. So it thinks that for the 30% of probability, it thinks this person is um, adult and with the 70% of the probability that this model thinks that currently that this uh, person is a teenager, right? And then well, what we want to do then is that, okay, uh, what we need to do is then um, we want to tune the parameters of the uh, model. In this case, uh, F has uh, parameters of theta, right? So what we want to do is then, let's say this is a training data, then we want to find uh, theta that maximizes, well, um, the probability of the ground truth. So we know what the ground truth is for this person during training time, right? So let's say this person was actually um, not a teenager, but adult, then we want to maximize this value, right? So basically then we want to maximize that value. So that's why um, we will, the, 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 the training objective will be, um, let's maximize the, uh, the first number of this vector. So um, there are several ways to uh, write this um, well, you can think of this as a, well, I think better way to write this is I think 
um, P of uh, X. So target is, right? And then this P of Y adult is equivalent to um, basically F of uh, uh, F theta of X and the first value. So yeah, I'm not sure the best way to put this, but let's say, just, let's just try to use a subscript uh, to indicate that this is the first number, right? There are several ways to write this, but um, I hope you get the point. So we're trying to maximize that value. It depends on how we parameterize this function, but um, that's what we're trying to do. That's what's called maximum likelihood estimation. Of course, we're not just optimizing the parameters for this specific instance. So if you have uh, several examples, then we're uh, uh, trying to maximize its expectation instead of the um, apparently just one single instance. Um, so hopefully that's clear. And then um, now then still the problem is that, uh, well, can we also always guarantee that this function that we have, let's say we're using um, some linear transformation for this, uh, for the parameterization, parameterization of this function, can we always guarantee that this, out, this output will be a valid probabilistic distribution? And uh, the answer is probably not, uh, given what we just learned until now, right? But then the uh, answer here is that you can use softmax to turn this into always into probability distribution given real number vectors. So um, this is the uh, equation. I think hopefully this also uh, is a review for most of you. So as you see, uh, if you put uh, these, these numbers, so zi, zz, zz um, then, then you expons exponentiate them. So what that does is that exponentiation maps the um, real number to positive numbers, and then just you divide these um, well, this each number by the summation of all these numbers. So I think uh, if you have some uh, troubles on this, I think one way to, uh, I think it's good to maybe uh, take a review on some yeah, uh, other materials on the web, or we can also chat about this in the lab, but let's, uh, let's, go, for, uh, let's go to the next um, step for now as we're running out of time. Okay, then. Um, other issue is that uh, when you're performing the joint probability, because um, at the end, okay, so um, there are several ways to actually put it. I said expectation, but other way to put it is that you can think of as joint probability of, over a um, large number of examples, and that will be too small. It will be causing underflow. So that's why we take logarithm on, on, on top of that. So we conven for convenience, we put negative sign and minimize it because it's the same as maximizing it, right, without the negative sign. So that's why it's called negative log likelihood, so NLL. And we average log probabilities for a stable scale regardless of the size of training data. So it's basically in the log space, it's averaging. In the uh, an actual prob log probability space, it's averaging. So it's averaging, right? Um, wait, yeah, it's not extra averaging. Yeah, so, um, so in, that will be equivalent to actually more of a um, uh, square rooting, right? Here, where should we put this? Um, yeah, it will be, okay, it will be here. I think a little bit, you yep. probably that. So yeah, so what we want to do is something like this, right? With the N. Where? So um, that's what we want to compute, but then the good thing about this is that you can actually uh, make this into nice um, form, which is very controllable. So um, the whole point of this was trying to motivate why, we, why we're using this kind of um, the uh, negative log likelihood um, function when we are trying to optimize for um, categorical model training, okay? So, um, so how about the, um, um, how, how can we use this for um, other things? For instance, um, not just the um, gender, class, not gender, but um, adult teenager classification, but maybe more complicated things. 
one classic example is image classification. So the task here is that you classify a small image into one of uh, digits. And there are 10 digits. So it's a 10 way classification. So then in that case, and input, what would be the input here? Well, the input is that um, we're assuming that the size of the, uh, the input image is always fixed. So it will be, um, I think it was, was it 13 by 13 or something like that? I don't exactly remember the size, but it's, if it's 13 by 13 pixels, then it will be um, 169 pixels, right? And then um, 169 pixels, each pixel has in this case, grayscale. So it will be a uh, one single uh, real number. So it will be a vector of 169. I think it was not 13 though. I think it was something like 114. But anyways, what matters is that um, you, if it's a uh, color, it's RGB color, then this will be three numbers instead of one numbers. So then um, you have a uh, hundred pixels, then it will be 300 num numbers. So it'll be 300 dimension vector and you just flatten that. So that, that will be a, it's just like how you saw this um, high prediction model. It's same thing, you have a vector input. And output is now it's categorical, but we saw how we, we can handle that. So it will be one of 10 class labels. So we just create a one hot vector of size 10. And well, what kind of model we can use? We learned last lecture that we can use a multi-layer, multi-linear transformation with the activation in the middle to induce the non-linearity. So that's why we can use um, just single, maybe two layer real network with a single activation might be able to actually achieve pretty good accuracy with um, um, this data set. In fact, it actually does. It's not too bad. Um, we use Rally here. Um, well, we can. I think in the early days, people use other activation like 10H. They used also um, Sigmoid for image classification, image classifications too. But um, they realized um, earlier that than NLP that uh, they can just use ReLU or sim sim similar things to ReLU like Jalu or um, some other variants to do most of these, um, non, um, well, the, um, the nonlinear activation. And later, I think NLP also kind of follow that too. So we rarely use other things than ReLU or its variants. It's very similar to ReLU, everything is. So then how about now, finally text classification? Actually, it's a bit more complicated, right? Because let's say we're trying to classify a movie review into positive or negative. Then input is text and output is good or bad. Well, it's not really good or bad here. It's actually out of 10, but let's say it's good or bad. Maybe good is above seven and bad is small, smaller than six or less or equal to six. Then, how can we do this? Um, I think the output part is not too bad. It's same as the image, but then input part is tricky, right? Because, well, is text similar to image input? Not really. Um, what was the problem, first problem? Well, first of all, the input is not a real vector. Although you can think of it as real vector if you actually um, really interpret that in the, um, well, byte level, but then um, still um, it's not interpretable that way. So uh, input is not real vector. Now the, the problem comes. And so what is the uh, solution here? Well, we learned that, okay, if the input is not a real vector, then we can categorize it and then try to use one half vector on top of that. But that also has a problem, right? Because apparently, can you categorize text into a finite number of classes? And the answer is no, right? Because there will be like technically infinite number of uh, possible text sequences and you cannot possibly categorize that at all. So it doesn't make sense to categorize the entire text. Maybe it makes more sense to categorize um, a part of it, or we first basically divide that into some meaningful units and then we categorize each unit. That's what people call tokenization. So what tokenization does is that we're given text, which as a whole is of course um, not categorizable into finite number of units, but then um, classes. But then if you tokenize this well enough, then you're assuming that each unit or the tokens is categorizable. And that number of categories or the, the set of the categories is what we call vocabulary in um, NLP. 
So for instance, if we categorize with this kind of um, some um, method, well, in this case, it's very simple way of, of tokenization. We probably used space to tokenize it, right? Um, it's very simple, but then still it's, it's actually quite effective in many cases. So space tokenization is quite effective. Um, we can probably see that, oh, then we're, if we actually tokenize this way, then we can probably say 99% um, of web documents or the tokens will be, um, will can be actually explained by vocabulary of size of like say 100K, 100,000. Of course, you can always create a new token or new word. So you cannot always fully categorize everything um, in this text. So that's why you also have a, a token called Ankh. Ankh is uh, referring to a token that you actually just assign if you are not able to find uh, it in your predefined categories. Uh, it's actually, I didn't write this here, but then it's called Ankh. Um, so there are several ways to tokenize um, documents. Um, well, apparently uh, the easiest way is, uh, as I just mentioned, is the um, space tokenization. And so this is just, uh, you can put anything in the string here. And then if you just say Python split, then it will automatically white space tokenize it. And white space means not just space, but a tab or any other, um, well, some space that you don't see. And you can do even better. So there were uh, traditionally many good tokenizers like MACAP tokenizer or NLTK tokenizer. Um, these are very carefully engineered. They're regular expression based and also quite fast. Um, they're doing things like this, for instance, um, in English, for instance, um, let's say that I have a token like, I don't know. Then it's clear that we want to probably tokenize I and no, but then it's not clear how we can tokenize don't. Are, are we gonna consider that as a one token or maybe two tokens? Because don't really is a short form of a do not, right? So these tokenizer, what they do is um, they can, for instance, tokenize this into do and apostrophe T and apostrophe T and no. Although there is no space between do and, and T, right? But then it makes more sense sometimes to do this way. So that's what these tokenizers are able to uh, do. But these are all manually engineered tokenizers, right? So that means um, they are, well, created by humans. Whereas you can also create data-driven tokenizers, which is more popular these days, especially in English. Maybe in Korean, I think there are still debates or some more of a, I think, um, other languages. But um, in English, it's it's clear that we're going very data driven. Um, so the point here is that um, we want to tokenize in 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 a way that the, the 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 tokens you define allow you to compress the input as much as possible in the information theoretical way. Of course, the uh, the really doing compression as much as possible is not really easy to do. So it's not optimal. It's more of a greedy way of doing it. But then still, the objective is to do the compression, just like uh, um, I think you learn in your undergrad class, like uh, um, Hoffman encoding for MP3, right? MP3 Hoffman encoding is also uh, trying to compress, one way to compress it. You can think of this as a very similar to Hoffman encoding, except that um, we actually use them not to compress the text, but to actually represent uh, text into tokens. So the most popular one here is bipair encoding. So this is the uh, root for most data driven tokenizers. Uh, we'll talk about this in lecture seven when we're going into transformer, more of a modern architecture for um, the natural language processing. But um, you can think of this for now as just the compression technique. And then um, there are a few Variants of bipair encoding. Uh, it's shorthand, usually BPE, and there are some um, variants of bipair encoding, like word piece, sentence piece. Uh, of, both of them developed by Google. People use this inter interchangeably. Let's get get. We'll get to this later. And then um, now, of course, um, we, how we can construct the vocabulary because we need still need a predefined set of uh, categories, right? So how many categories for each token are there? We need to know this before uh, training so that the neural network size is fixed. And the set of all token categories is called vocab. 
I talk about this. And there are several ways to actually build your vocab. One is that you can use a pre-built dictionary for the vocab, right? Um, what that means is that maybe you can bring in your personal Ox Oxford um, dictionary and then list all the vocab that people have defined. Um, that that might be your vocab, or you can build vocab from uh, your training data. Um, so choice one is, I think, quite apparent. How how do you do choice number choice two? You have training data, for instance, in tax classification, then you just bring all the data in the in training data, and then you tokenize it with your tokenizer we just talked about, and then you just, um, you have now a lot of tokens and you just create a set of them. So we move the duplicates, then that will be your vocab. But it just uh, actually, it's not done there usually. What you do on top of that is that you want to remove some very, um, very rare words because if you see only one or two times in your training data, it's very unlikely that you'll anyways learn anything meaningful on top of that. That's number one reason. But then number two reason is that you still need to be able to handle onc token, which is the uh, very rare tokens. And you need to observe that during training too. So that means you have to actually assign some tokens to onc, And that will be um, required to for the model to how to handle the onc tokens. So it's actually important to create onc tokens by um, in, in, a, in a sense, ignoring very uh, rare words in training data. And these, after ignoring these rare words, whatever remaining, including the onc, will be the, your vocab. And how about the variable input length? Well, this is something that if I taught this class like five years ago, probably I would, I would have not said this way, but because back then um, people thought that the, um, the one of the, the most important characteristics of NLP is the fact that the input length is variable length. And that was why they wanted to create models that can handle variable length, like um, what we'll cover today, RNN. But then it turns out that especially these days in practice input text Input length is not really, um, doesn't have to be considered as variable. You can just consider that as fixed. So what does that mean? Well, if let's say you fix the input length to um, 16 and then your input is eight, then your actual input is shorter than your input length. I mean, the fixed input length, right? Then you just make that into same length by padding just the uh, meaningless tokens. It's called pad because you just pad those them. So it's you can pad them to increase the um, uh, length of the text, or you can, if your input, actual input is longer than your uh, pre, uh, predefined length, then you can truncate. Of course, truncation is worse than padding because you lose information. But then the point is that anyways, if your input during inference is longer than what you have defined during training, it's very hard to handle that unless you do that in a smarter way. For instance, um, you split that into several paragraphs and then process independently and then somehow aggregate later. That might be okay, but then you, you cannot really um, anyway handle that if you haven't seen that kind of uh, input during training time. So um, I think I can, um, well, at least now I can say that you can just think of the input like fixed. It will be much easier for you to create any model during this um, class for the assignments or anything. So. Um, but then, um, yeah, it was not the case five years ago. So, um, so I just have an example here too, right? If you fix the input size to four, then um, we can do this thing. And so you see that the um, pad token is here. If it's longer, then we see that it's actually truncated. So well is gone. So yeah, it was great. It's great because now we finally have a fixed size real value inputs from the text because that was the two issues we had with the text input, right? It's not real valued. And number two, it's not fixed size, but then we can tokenize them to make them real valued. Um, and then we can also uh, do padding and truncation to make them fixed size. And what that means is that uh, mathematically, let's say the, the size of vocab is V, and then uh, size of length of the input, number of tokens is T, then what we're saying is that we're transforming any kind of text input to T by V size matrix, or if flattened, then vector length will be 
t times v, although very rarely you will actually flatten them. But unlike image, right? Um, actually, these days, actually, uh, image domain, um, I mean, they, they don't actually flatten an image too. They use um, some location specific, um, like CNNs. So it's very rare that you actually flatten them. But then you can think of that as vector too. It's just how you organize them, numbers. All right, so um, what I'll just go for one example. We'll take like a three minute break because we started so late today and then um, come back for the second part. So here is the uh, the uh, very simple example again. So let's say the input was hello world. And then we have tokenizer. Um, I took with the uh, this vocab world, hello, exclamation mark, unk, pad. And we have tokens, hello world and um, exclamation mark by the tokenizer. And we are supposed that we are fixing the input length to four. Then um, the one hot vector is of the input will be these. And you will see that uh, if you actually put it in a, um, well, better way, actually, it's more accurate to say that uh, you can think of this as, well, we want T by V matrix. So what is T here? T is um, four, right? So we want four here. So four by uh, each row vector will be a, a basic vector corresponding to each token, one hot vector. So it will be zero, one, zero, zero, oh, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. And um, it's one here because vocab, uh, the hello is the second index. Second index is index number one, right? Um, and then world is the first word in the vocab. So that's why it's taking up the one hat vector here. Um, and then exclamation mark is third. That's why you're putting here. And then um, you have padding. So that's why you have a fifth um, token, fifth token in the vocab here. So, and you just make this into matrix over so four by five. And what is the output size? Well, because we're doing um, categorical output of the text classification, and we saw that we want to also make this into one half vector. So it will be um, output size of uh, um, two, right? And this can be corresponding to positive, and this can be corresponding to negative. All right, so um, we're going to get a three minute break until the um, 9.52, and yeah, we'll go for the, the rest of the lecture when we come back.
is there a reason why you um, trying to stress up what is stress? Um, well, number one, I think KLMS doesn't have any um, communication features. So anyway, we need additional communication platform and just makes everything so complicated. I think that's the biggest reason. And I knew oh, number two is actually the KAIST is actually officially offering class mm -hmm. So um, I think they're recommending okay. us to use it too. I think, it's, yeah, I haven't used it before though. Let's try it, yeah. Have you used it? Um, first time myself also. Oh, okay. But anyways, KAIST student made it, so. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. I think. <sighs> All right, so let's get started with the uh, second part. Okay, so you might, you, ha you might have been wondering, so, okay, that's great, but then um, you have heard of this, something called word embedding, where is it coming? Where is it being, um, where is it in the model? In fact, so this is the important thing. Um, in fact, actually, if you create a model on top of these one hot vectors, um, whatever you put on top of these input will be actually word embeddings. So that's actually a really important point. So I wrote here, the first layer of the neural network that is applied on the one half vectors can be considered as word embedding. So why is that? So because let's say that your input was, <clears throat> um, again, T by V. And then we know that when we're trying to perform the linear transformation, then we're, um, we're gonna actually multiply matrix on, on this, right? So then let's suppose, suppose that we multiply, um, because input size is V, let's say that we multiply this to um, a matrix of V by D. So that's like, a, maybe you can consider this as a first layer of your neural networks after you um, have the input from the um, text, right? And what I'm trying to say is that this will be one hot vector, right? So it will be like something like zero, 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 um, zero, one, zero, one. So this will be always one hot vector. This is a, this is a one hot. Uh, it's a one hot vector, right? Um, then whatever you put here, suppose, um, Let's see. Suppose that um, I have uh, several vectors here too. Uh, like that. Then the, the point here is that whatever you put here will be replaced by um, the exact vector at that location of this uh, V by D matrix. So it's actually easy to see that mathematically. So um, why is that? Because, well, this will be, um, I think it's easier to say this way. So the, what, what will be the size of this matrix multiplication? It will be T by D. And we know that here, um, these matrix will be actually exactly uh, the vectors on uh, on in this this matrix that corresponds to the location of the your one hot vector. So what you're basically doing is that if you perform a matrix linear la layer on top of this uh, inputs, then you're effectively just actually indexing. Um, the embedding vectors from the embedding matrix. So it's of course then not really efficient to perform any matrix multiplication because effectively what you're doing is just actually, um, you're just um, loading these vectors and then just replacing, replacing them with this D-dimensional vectors, right? So that's why um, you actually do not use matrix multiplication on this for in PyTorch. What you use instead is um, um, NN.embedding you have heard of these things. Um, and it's exactly equivalent thing though. I mean, it's just that it's more efficient doing this way because this operation happens on CPUs instead of GPUs. If you had to um, compute this on the, um, on the uh, GPUs, then it will be very um, 
well, computationally inefficient. And you usually do not call this actually um, uh, really a layer. Well, so when you say first layer, it usually means that the layer after this word embedding layer. So um, if you have word embedding, then probably it means that you have a two layers. I mean, you have word embedding with single layer, then you actually have a two layers. First layer being the layer corresponding to the word embedding, and then um, which we call embedding instead of layer. And then second layer is the actual layer that you will actually use for the um, deep learning. Um, and we also do not usually put an activation on top of word embeddings because there isn't really any linear transformation happening here, right? So what does that mean? Well, because if you're just actually indexing the embeddings, then it's not really any transformation. It's more of a just loading the vectors. So there is no reason to really put any activation on top of this. That's why we don't put activations. So um, that means then um, a typical model that can be, uh, well, that will be applicable to text input is something like, suppose that your input was, um, well, suppose that your input was um, T by V, then you have an embedding which is V by D. And then let's say that you have a, another uh, layer which is D by, um, let's say that you have two layers, for instance, um, you might have a D by D weight, and then you have a, a second layer, which is D by two. Then in that case, then what you can do is, it's not a, I'll put this here. Then what you can do is then you can think of this as a Y equal to you first perform um, X and you get the embedding mathematically. And then you perform W1 uh, plus maybe bias, and then you do some activation. Uh, we usually use sigma to just call all the activation, not just uh, sigmoid, but then also it can be used for sigmoid too. And then you again perform the second um, linear mapping, and this will be um, two. Um, it's a vector of uh, size two. And you can use softmax on top of this to make this into categorical, categorical inputs, not categorical outputs. Okay. So I think there is an example here, right? So um, again, applying a linear transformation on one half vector is computationally inefficient. So we actually use the vocab IDs as the input instead. So instead of actually doing the um, all these one hot vector thing, wait, why, why not just, why don't we just actually just put the, uh, the token index in the vocab. Then instead of, uh, you remember this uh, one hot vectors of the, our previous input, it's very long, but then instead of that, just we can um, make that into one, zero, two, four. And then we just use the uh, indexing feature of PyTorch or TensorFlow to get the, these vectors. They're effectively same thing as this though. Um, effectively same thing as this this part. Oh, sorry, not that, this part. And um, this is the, of course, a way of getting the word embedding during your training. But it is actually um, relatively recent. I mean, the word embedding itself is also very recent, but then um, it's also relatively recent about like eight years ago that people found that um, it might be better to have um, these word embeddings predefined because we can think of this word embeddings as some way of uh, representing the, the semantics of the word in the vector space, right? And then if we can find a way to uh, pre-train such word embeddings, then uh, they are, and we hope that their values imply their semantics. So I'm not sure you can see this well, but then you will see that some meaningful vectors are clustered together like this. Um, for instance, like these are like oven, microwave, refrigerators, LG, so something that you can find in your, in your kitchen. And then maybe um, these are like valve, kit, um, garden, the green ones, hose, and sprinkler, something that you can find in your garden, right? So um, let's say that we had these um, words cluster that you see that their location actually 
or the uh, their content, right? Their parametric content actually corresponds to the semantics. The semantics means the meaning. The it, semantics is you can think of that as a synonym to meaning. So basically, when I say semantics, basically imply imply their semantics is imply their meaning. Um, so then what, what would be the best way to actually create this embedding so that we can utilize that right away instead of starting from randomly initialized vectors when we're training models. And the early works include uh, word to vec and globe vectors. Actually, for your assignment one, you'll be using globe. And word to vec is also uh, earlier work that people used a lot. Um, for now, uh, for the sake of a time being, and also because um, this is really related to, in fact, the um, pre-trained pre language model that we'll be covering in the second part of this uh, course. And also, um, I think people aren't using this anymore, really. So I don't want to put too much time on this, but then you can think of this as they're obtained from some word core current statistics in web documents uh, for now. And assume that they are just given for you so that you can uh, have a better initialization than um, just starting from random ones because they have some semantics. And you will see in your assignment that actually they help. That's great. So now we talk about, okay, we can create, um, you know, single input that represents the entire text. And then we can also um, build some neural network on top of that, just like what I've showed you here, right? Um, but oh, one thing I wanted to notice that, yeah, in this case, the um, because we have a T dimension, actually, it's actually T by two, sorry. Yeah, so we have, in this case, then we have a, a, the, the vector of two for each token in the X. So you have to do some sort of a, um, actually pulling on top of that. I'll talk about this soon, but uh, let's say that we just actually made this into just one vector. We can just do that by, you know, just just flattening. Um, then, well, let's say we did that. Then the issue with that is that we're considering the entire input as one vector. And that's bad because that means then we're considering that as a, well, just like uh, there is no, you cannot model the sequential dependency among the tokens, right? But the, we know that text data has sequential dependency, uh, which means that the meaning of the next word depends on the previous word. So for instance, what is the meaning of apple here? Um, is that they're different exactly because whatever comes before apple really defines the meaning of apple, right? So if you said that the Q2 earning report of Apple, then probably means that the Apple here is the company Apple. But then um, if you said, I ate an apple today, that probably means um, actual something that you eat, a fruit apple. So exactly, apparently the, um, in NLP, there is sequential dependency and also contextual dependency. And then with the model we were just talking about, well, maybe they're able to, uh, if we stack uh, deep layers but then can we inject this sequential dependency in, into the model? Or we, which means can we design the model in a way that um, basically can we, how can we put this inductive bias into this model so that they are, these models can be better suited for um, sequential modeling. And I think it's a more of a spoiler alert that, uh, that you might be wondering, especially given that I think many of you have started working on this, I think after Transformer or BERT, um, is sequential dependency really much, that much important? And it turns out that we'll come back to this again, that, um, well, it is important, but that it's not as important as, um, well, stacking layers, because the when you stack layers, the sequential dependency naturally comes in too. We'll see that uh, in, in later, but then for now, I think it's worth noting that, um, well, um, it's, it's, it might be better to put such inductive bias. Although I guess like in maybe uh, three or four years, if I'm teaching this class again, then maybe in, in, in when that, that, that time comes, then maybe it doesn't make sense to really teach anything about RNNs. Um, but anyways, I think still it makes, it's, it's important, right? Because um, you, you can still think of this 
being used in the decoder side for those of you who know what that means. But anyways, yeah. So um, in order to incorporate such sequential dependency, we can first build a layer on top of the first token. It's the same thing as uh, what we do um, for image or what we talk about simple neural networks, right? But then what we can do on top of that is that we can build another layer that depends on both the output of the first layer and the second token. So it's, be it's, be it's best explained by this part, right? So we have the uh, word embedding corresponding to the first token, which is X T minus one. And we have some transformation, U, for instance, and then let's say that um, we did some uh, transformation and then we got this HT minus one, let's call this HT minus one. And what we want to do here is then we want to, uh, when we're modeling the second tokens um, output, we want it to be dependent on the first tokens output and the current token as well. So that's why we use this and then we have some application of linear layer V. And then we have a linear, a linear transformation from the, the current token XT. And we add these two to get the HT. So in this case, then HT is equal to, um, it depends on how you actually put this, but um, now we're operating in the, um, in the transposed space than what we're talking about up to now. But um, so technically you can think of this as, I think let's just say this way. So HT minus one, and then you apply, um, well, V to this, uh, this matrix and you apply XT, you transform this into, um, again, the, the dimensional vector. And oftentimes you put a bias here You might want to or not. Let's just assume that there is a bias. Uh, so then this is a recurrent relationship, right? Because this HT depends on not only the current input, but also the previous previous inputs output or the hidden state. H is sending for hidden state. And the good thing about this is that because we define the recurrent relation, we can use this same layer recurrently uh, without worrying about how long the um, sequence is. So otherwise, if we actually don't define such recurrent relationship, then we might have to have one parameter for every length of every token in the, in the um, I mean, we need a number, of, the number of parameters will be equivalent to the number of uh, tokens, right? But then that's, um, well, not a good thing because um, even if we fix the input size, well, it, we don't want the model to actually depend on the input size too, right? Because we might want to change the input size after we, uh, we define the model. So, and it's actually also good because if you just increase number of parameters, then it actually is very likely to not um, train well. Because what we're assuming here is that the language has some sequential recurrence relationship and that, that it makes more sense to actually use the same parameters because it's uh, processing on each token in the same way where, wherever the token is depending on the previous and the current input and we you see this w and ot minus ot2 it's just like one another step that depends just on ht so it depends on what your um, application is right so if your application is um, two-way classification, then probably this W will be mapping D dimension to two so that you have a probabilistic distribution for this categorical um, output. Um, but then there's another issue. One is that um, we will cover more issues next lecture, but then one big issue here is that uh, if we just end there um, with this recurrent relationship, you will see that this is just only linear transformations happening. And that means at the end, it'll be just equivalent to a single linear layer on top of the every X. So it, it's, uh, I recommend you to actually uh, prove this yourself when you have time, but then it's easy to see actually that um, it's exactly just a single linear layer. If you just uh, have a only uh, linear transformation, 
So what we need is actually not just linear layer, but again, activation. So we need activation where? We need activation at the recurrent relationship. So we need activation so that uh, when we're defining HT, this is basically, we use some activation and then uh, we do this uh, on top of activation on top of the uh, out, uh, the linear transformed addition. So um, this can be written as plus right. So this is the important part. Um, that can be well sigmoid like ten h or ReLU. In RNNs, uh, people usually use 10H because it's better than sigmoid. Sigmoid, as you know, uh, is just mapping from mapping to zero, zero to one. So it doesn't have sign. So people thought 10H is better because the sign is going from negative one to uh, positive one. Uh, people didn't use ReLU because um, that basically means then um, ReLU will not be bounded. So um, if they're, everything is positive, then basically you're multiplying um, on the positive side in, uh, indefinitely. So well, actually expose the values if you use that on recurrent neural net. So um, we can also, you can also see this, um, probably we cannot cover this today, but let's see if we can do that in the lab, lab session next week. Um, so wrapping up soon, but last thing uh, I wanna cover actually two things actually. Number one is that um, that's great. We now have these, all these outputs, OT, OT minus one, OT plus one. But then um, which output should we use? Well, maybe one, one of the most obvious thing to use is the last output, which is the uh, OT o of the final output, right? But then um, that's not always the, uh, that's one option. Another option is that maybe you can just um, aggregate all these outputs, right? And do some summation or averaging or anything. That's called pooling. So the pooling, is actually something similar to mean, mean pooling, um, max pooling, mean pooling, uh, so mean pooling and min pooling, right? So it's uh, mean pooling and min pooling. So some way of uh, averaging things or some way of uh, making um, some matrix, removing one dimension from the matrix, right? So, um, so the information has to go through a lot of layers if you just use the final output. So it's usually recommended that um, you pull somehow. In fact, that's quite relevant to why people use, um, for instance, the uh, residual, residual net too. So it's it's not easy, it's not good idea to actually try to make your output dependent on well sequentially the inputs or anything. It's 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 good to assume that there's there's some weight for each um, layer or each time step to have a direct access to the output. So it's kind of shortcut. Uh, but usually you can think of this as um, um, you usually do just uh, pulling instead of using final output. Because anyway, when you pull, then your um, your your um, pulled output also depends on the final output too. And there are several types of pulling. Yeah, mean pulling, averaging, max pulling is getting just the max in each dimension. Mean is getting the minimum. We're gonna cover this in the lab session too. And um, last thing is that also this is something probably you learned in the previous class, but the dropout is quite effective in RNNs. Um, so um, but one thing also is that you don't want to apply dropout in the recurrent relationship because uh, that means then um, it's going through a lot of uh, dropout nodes as the T increases. So important thing is that dropout has to be applied at the output, not the, in the recurrent relationship. Um, so um, it's something that also we can probably cover in the lecture in the lab. But then uh, the point is that when you apply RNNs, then you first do the RNNs in the regular way, and then you apply dropout on the outputs of the RNNs. And then if you have a multiple layer of RNNs, then basically RN layer, dropout, RN layer, dropout. If you're putting out, uh, dropout on the output side, you can do the other way too, right? You can put dropout in the input side and then uh, just stack it, but not in the recurrent relationship. Okay, so that's it. I, okay, I don't know why I have two slides for this, but yeah, that's it. So, um, okay, so 
that's it for today's lecture. Um, again, next lecture will be a lab session that will be covering this uh, lecture two material. So I'll, I'll see you uh, through Zoom, not here on Tuesday and um, on Thursday also through Zoom. That's because I'm in Jeju for the uh, business travel. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'll upload it if I didn't fail. Um, let's see. I think it's recorded this time. <laughs>